Because <laughs> I record to my PC the other day. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to um, the beginning of this four part series that we've just entitled Unveiling the Mystery. Welcome to all those on Zoom and all those who'll be watching as well. If you have any questions from the Zoom folk or even those who might be watching after this, please get in touch with us at the church. Go to our website, find us, and uh, you can ask some questions. But hopefully throughout the next couple of months, as we consider these important topics uh, relating to the church, that some things will make sense. So hopefully, if you're too comfortable today with what I'm saying, then you're not hearing what I'm saying. But you should be uncomfortable. And the reason why is because I believe that often when it comes to Bible teaching, people have a concept of what someone means or what they think they mean. And what I'm sharing with you is not super special or super unique that no one else knows this. But often what you will find is in ministries, they don't focus on the area that I will focus on the next uh, few few months, really, a couple of months. Because they know that some of the things, people share some of these things, but I really want to focus on what these verses mean and what Paul means when he speaks about the mystery. So that's going to be very, very important. But before we start, I want to open in prayer. So let us pray and thank the Lord for this time together. Father, we thank and praise you for your goodness and grace and mercy to us. What a day we have, Lord, that we can come together this afternoon and hear your word. Thank you for all those here with us in church. Thank you also for those who join us on Zoom. And we just pray there will be a great encouragement to us. Please, Holy Spirit, open our eyes, help us to understand and help us to be greatly encouraged by your word today. As we commit ourselves to you, Lord, we pray your blessing on everything said and done. In your wonderful name, we pray the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. So through this four-part series, there are four passages of Scripture that I want to focus on, and I'm, that's going to be the basis of the discussion. So it's not too topical. It's not just me talking. It's looking at the Scriptures themselves and seeing what God is saying, but there's going to be many other verses I'll bring into it. So today, the first part to this Unveiling the Mystery series I've just entitled, Kept Secret Since the World Began. So I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 16. So Romans chapter 16, we read from verse 25 to 27. So we're just going to read and then I'll give an introduction and then we'll look at the text. The Romans 16, verse 25 to 27. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now has been made manifest. And by the prophetic scriptures has been made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. To God only alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. So that's the basis for our discussion. That's the passage, the mystery kept secret since the world began. So biblically, and especially in the New Testament, the word mystery is used quite often. But Paul the Apostle uses the term mystery very specific. It's not just a general mystery. It's a very specific mystery. And he connects it to the Christian church being a mystery. And here you have that in Romans chapter 16. And that's very, very important. So when he speaks of the mystery connected to the church, what he's dealing with is a truth that was not revealed in the Old Testament. And you'll find that as you read Ephesians chapter 3. So when he speaks of the mystery of the church, he is saying that the mystery of the church is a new revelation in the New Testament. It wasn't there in the Old Testament. And I will also defend the fact that I believe it wasn't in the Gospels. It is something that was revealed after Jesus Christ died and rose again and ascended into heaven. We'll deal with that and I'll, and I'll prove that point. And you can uh, discern if, if, you, if you agree or not. So that is key. So a mystery in the New Testament is a truth that wasn't revealed in the Old Testament. Now, what are the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What are the Gospels? 
Because when we look at the Gospels, it's become the basis and the foundation for Christianity pretty much for the last 2,000 years. Bible teaching is gone. People aren't really focused as much on teaching the scriptures as a whole. It's more generally in Christianity. Look at the life of Jesus. Try and draw something from there. Apply it somewhere in your life, and hopefully you live a good life. That's the sort of thinking that many people have. And I've taught here yeah, this truth, and I shared with you once again, that I believe that the Gospels make up the Old Testament and not the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So if you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9, I just want to sort of share that with you. So a lot of things I'm going to say throughout this series, but especially today, I'm going to try and prove a point to you. You don't have to agree, but you have to think through it and eat the orange and spit out the pips. But I need to present this to you to, to think through. So Hebrews chapter 9, you're going to read from verse 16 to, to 18. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. So there it tells you, the writer of Hebrews tells us that a testament only comes of effect or in effect when the testator dies. And who is the one who is the author of the Old and the New Testament, the Old Covenant, the New Covenant? It's the Lord Jesus Christ, God. And therefore, the New Testament only comes in force and is enforced when the testator dies. You can't have the New Testament while Jesus is alive. Because the whole premise of the New Covenant is the Messiah's death. And therefore, when we read the Gospels, Jesus Christ came to confirm the promises made to the fathers, according to Romans 15, verse 8. He came to affirm and confirm what was said in the Old Testament, fulfill the prophecies, and fulfill the law, and then usher in a new covenant. And therefore, that is very important. So if we base the, the majority of our Christian lives, and especially the majority of the Christian teaching, and especially the church, based upon the gospel, it becomes a great concern because the Gospels are not there for us to build church around what the Gospels are because the Gospels are completely different from church life because, yes, the truth is applicable. You can use the truth, but the principles there has to specifically do with Jesus Christ coming to the covenant people and dealing with Israel, preaching to Israel. Even his, the way that Jesus Christ uses the law is not the same way in which we will use the law in general. This is the thing about the day and just chatting to someone about that. If you go out into the unbelieving world and use the law in the same way that Jesus did, it makes no sense because Jesus spoke to people who knew the law. Makes sense. He spoke to Jewish people who knew the law. So he would speak to them about the law and things like, we go out to the world who don't know the law. You ever go to non-Jews or or pagans and speak to them about the law, they're not going to understand the law. You deal with them with the gospel. And therefore, the gospels cannot be the basis of our understanding of the church and how the church should function and what the church should do. And there are several mysteries in the scriptures. But when Paul the Apostle speaks of the mystery, he speaks of the Christian church. And I'll, I'll deal with those passages to, to confirm some aspects to it. So, again, part of the introduction. I believe that there are three churches in the Bible. Three churches. And that means groups at a time that get that are basically incorporated into God's plan. The first church was the nation of Israel. When did they become a church? They became a church when they left Egypt. When you, if you turn with me to Acts chapter 7, verse 38. So Acts chapter 7, verse 38. It's Stephen. And it says here. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us. The congregation there is the word ecclesia, which is the word we use for the church. 
So there was a called out group, which is what the word church means. The word church doesn't mean building. The word church means a called out group. There was a called out group in the wilderness. It's very important, even from a Jewish perspective, the Jews themselves see the birth of Israel, not with Abraham, but when they left Egypt. That's when the nation was birthed. The moment they stepped over or crossed the Red Sea on dry land, they were baptized into Moses, according to 1 Corinthians 10. They then became a congregation of people that are God's people. They became a church. And all those who want to join the church need, knew what the process was. And that process was circumcision, become a proselyte, and become part of the covenant people. We're not talking about salvation here. We're talking about becoming part of God's called out group. In the Old Testament, it was the nation of Israel. Now, the Greek word ecclesia is called out. It's the same word you can find in Hebrew in the Old Testament, which is kahol. It's the same word. It means a called out group. And David speaks about that. I will sing your praises in the midst of the congregation. The kahol, the called out group. So in the Old Testament, there is a church. And that church is the nation of Israel as a collective group that God worked with. And you can find, of course, all the evidence for that in the scriptures. Now, this is the one that's slightly controversial that I leave with you to think about. Many people disagree, but I ask these questions. I believe the second church is the church of the Gospels. Because if the word church, ecclesia, means to be called out, what did Jesus do with people at the time of his ministry? What was he doing with those in Israel who believed? He was busy calling them out. He called them the little flock. To you, the kingdom is given, the little flock. So when Jesus called the 12 and then went ministering, he was calling people out of Israel to become the foundation of the kingdom. And therefore, I believe that there was a church in the Gospels, those who were disciples who followed Jesus Christ, and they became the little flock or a group who was called a church. So when we look at Matthew 16, 16 to 18, and again, I will qualify why I say what I say. So when you look at Matthew 16, a very well-known passage, often quoted. So Matthew 16, uh, verse 16 to 18. Oh, yeah. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So the question I ask is, what is that church? And people will say, well, Jesus is looking ahead, so it must be the Christian church. Well, the question I ask and I leave with you is, what is the church built upon? What is the gospel that we share? The gospel we share is the preaching of the cross. If you look at Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if you confess the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you look at the passage here, what is the foundation here that the church we built upon in verse 16? You are the Messiah. That's what Christ means. Because when you speak to Jewish people, they don't say Jesus Christ. They say Yeshua, Mashiach. Mashiach is Messiah. It's Christ. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. The foundation of the little flock's ministry was not the cross. How do I know that? Because in the very same passage, Jesus tells them he's going to go down to Jerusalem, be handed over to the Gentiles, to be crucified, and Peter rebukes him. Because the gospel thrust in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was not the cross. Why? Because they didn't preach the cross because Jesus hadn't died yet, and they didn't, ex didn't look forward to that. They looked forward to the Messiah coming to rule and reign. So when they go out and they preach the kingdom and they preach the gospel of the kingdom, they're not preaching the cross. They're not preaching the death and the resurrection of Christ because the death and resurrection of Christ is only revealed later in its fullness. The disciples are surprised in Matthew 16 that Jesus was going to die. Why are you surprised if you're preaching it? So I believe that the, the second church that is what Jesus is referring to here is 
that this called out group who will be the thrust of his disciple ministry, who will carry out the Great Commission, was built upon the Messiah's ministry. And they became a church, a called out group. And therefore, the third church is the New Testament church. So why do I say this? Because what was this church made up of that Jesus spoke of here, who I spoke to? Were there any non-Jews there? Were there sorry, were there non-Jews hanging around in Jerusalem, just sort of with the disciples? No. When's the first time that Peter speaks to a non-Jew? When's the first time? Cornelius, which is Acts chapter 10, which plus minus 10 years after the ascension. So how do you have a collective body of Jew and Gentile, according to Ephesians 3, that meets up together, singing worship songs and hearing God's word preached together as a collective group, as a called up group? Where in any of the passages from Acts chapter 1 to Acts chapter 10, did they say that they were gathering collectively other than on a Sabbath day? I just leave that with you to think about. Because then you look at the New Testament church, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 to 3, and Galatians 3, 28. And this, I believe, is the third church, which is the collective body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 3. And then also we're going to look at Galatians 3, 28. And Paul writes and says, moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received and in which you stand, which you confirmed in, by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to to the scriptures in verse four as well, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So when's the first time that you hear that? You don't hear that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, that they went out preaching the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You don't see that. Wouldn't they, wouldn't they um, the, with the other apostles be preaching this gospel? No, no, in the gospels, they didn't do that. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. later on, they would, after the fact. After but we're talking day. about what they were preaching in the Gospels. Yeah. But and we're talking about the collective. So when we talk about after Acts 2, Pentecost, you're talking yeah, about the collective. Would, it still wasn't collective. Preached. They would have preached that Gospel. Yeah. But he's, he's, he's clearly drawing a dichotomy between what the apostles were preaching in the Gospels. Yeah. No, no, and I now suddenly, yeah, boom, you see. Yeah. I'm just saying, you establish into this. I'm just drawing the difference. There was right. a difference. Yeah. And then you look at Galatians 3.28. So Galatians 3.28 that Paul, again, writes as well. So Galatians 3.28. So it says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. So that is the foundation of the New Testament church, not so? There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The question I ask is, was that what Jesus preached? Did Jesus preach there's no difference between Jew and Gentile? Do not go. Do not go. Yes. So highlighting that what our understanding is of a called out group or a church is not necessarily just a New Testament thing. The New Testament church is the final called out group, but there have been called out groups before for a specific purpose. And that's the key point. And as soon as we hear the word church, we automatically think of us. We are the end of a long road of a process. Israel was a church. They were. Because church doesn't necessarily mean just those in Christ. Why? Well, I can prove it. In the book of Acts, there's a mob that wants to beat up Paul. And it's called the church. It's called an ecclesia that came to beat him up because the word ecclesia just means a called out group. The church is just a called out group. The question is, which called out group and for what purpose do they gather and who are they? You have to look at their identity. That's a called out group, but they're a mob. 
Yeah. This is a called out group, but they're Christians. So just because the word church is used, you have to understand the context of how church is used. And this is very important as we go forward, because now dig a bit deeper to this and I ask, did Jesus Christ teach about the church as a joint body? And did he ever speak of Christianity? Did Jesus say anything other than what the Old Testament taught? And did he say anything other than Jews being preeminent and Gentiles being in a secondary position to the Jews? Because, of course, he's talking about Christianity, of course. So uh, the, the, where are those verses? There are no verses like that. Jesus Christ himself understood, because he wrote the Old Testament, what the process was. And we'll deal with that as we look at... So I think Jesus about. was, um, for want of a better expression, gobsmacked when, um, when the centurion um, said, he said of the centurion, I've not found faith like this anywhere, anywhere in Israel. It was, it was a surprise, yeah. So this is some thoughts here. Jesus taught about reaching the world 100%. I'm not denying that. Jesus taught about reaching the world with the gospel. But what was the foundation of the gospel that Jesus Christ told people to go out with? That's the key point. Because the problem is that we have this thinking in Christianity, and it's another thing I don't want to really scramble your head, but this thinking that there's only one gospel doesn't make sense to me biblically. Like I don't understand how someone can look at the scriptures and think there's only one message in the Bible. How is there only one gospel, one good news, when you have Noah and you have Abraham and you've got Israel and you've got the gospels and you've got the New Testament and all of those phases of God's plan and purpose, there was a message. Mm. When did Jesus talk? I mean, did Jesus talk about his father's the truth the way? There is no other way to have they except through him. Spot on. He talked about that he is the bread of life. So he was actually saying for everyone to believe in him. So that was what Jesus Spot on. Did Noah believe that? No. So, Noah. So when God spoke to Noah about what he must do to be saved, did he say that Jesus is the way, the truth, and life? No. He would have known. But I mean, they had the sacrificial system. But, but at no point did they know the sacrificial system looked forward to the Messiah. He said that. So you, so no, no. So you know that now. Yeah. It's, it's important because you know that now based upon what the scriptures have revealed to you and you look back. Mm -hmm. I'm asking, looking forward from here, did they see that? Because we assume that they knew exactly what you know. So when God spoke to Abraham, he didn't say to him, accept Jesus and move. He said, get out of your land. I'm going to make you a great nation. He did that. Faith responded. My faith, he was saved. Noah built an ark. That was faith. The principle has always been by faith, but the word gospel doesn't mean faith. The word gospel means good news. What is the good news at the time? And the good news to, to Noah was build an ark. Your family will be saved. The good news to Abraham was get out of your land. I'm going to make you a great nation. The good news to Israel was I'm going to make you a peculiar people, give you the oracles of God, and you will be a light to the Gentiles. The good news in the Gospels was the Messiah is now here, except the Messiah, the kingdom is to come. The good news in the New Testament is Jesus has died, risen again. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. All who accept the Lord Jesus Christ can be saved. Boom. There's already five Gospels. And that's the key point. And that's why it scrambles us because everyone's made it all focused on Jesus. And he, of course, is the scarlet thread, 100%. But at the time, they didn't know about Christianity. They didn't know about the future. They didn't know about church. They didn't know about people coming together. They only received what was given to them at the time and responded in faith to that. It was, but they didn't know that. We know that. Because we know the Lord Jesus Christ. We have seen him in his flesh. If you haven't seen him in his flesh, you know. You just knew it was the angel. So from God's perspective, yes, we now see it because he's revealed that to us. At the time they spoke, when Moses spoke in the burning, burning bush, because the burning bush is amazing. There's actually two people speaking in the burning bush, by the way. It's actually the Lord Jesus Christ and Jehovah. If you read the text, it's amazing. Because Jesus Christ is in all of the Old Testament, 100%. But they didn't know that was him. We now know. And therefore, we assume that 
David knew exactly what we know. And that's why Paul calls it a mystery, which is what I'm going to unpack, because it wasn't revealed as it has now been revealed. So I'm going to ask a few questions on that. So Jesus thought about reaching the world 100% with the gospel. But what was the foundation? The foundation of him going out to reach the world, sending people out, was that the Jews were to be a light to the Gentiles. Two passages, Isaiah 42, verse 6, and Isaiah 49, verse 6. So Isaiah is okay. It's a major prophet. You should find that. Well, I say, the minor prophets will panic on a Sunday. Uh, Isaiah 42, first, verse 6. Isaiah 42, verse 6. Now listen to these words very carefully and think about what Jesus was saying. During the Gospels, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. Hmm. Of course, it's speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He will be a light to the Gentiles, but he will be given as a covenant to the people. Who are the people? Israel. People and Gentiles. But you see that what comes first? Gentiles or the people? Israel. Okay. Then we look at Isaiah 49, verse 6. Isaiah 49, verse 6. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. What comes first? Before you get to the Gentiles, you have Israel. Jacob. That was the picture. The picture in the Old Testament was very clear. The Gentiles will be reached 100%. But the Gentiles will be reached through the gathering and regeneration and foundation of the covenant People, it was never going to be just go out indiscriminately to Gentiles and reach them and leave Israel behind. That was never the Old Testament picture. No, not at all. They, they, they didn't mind reaching the Gentiles as long as they were the covenant people. They understood the promises that were given to them. They weren't, they weren't not willing to share those promises. That's the thing. They knew that there were certain promises given to them. And that's also very interesting how they asked that, because when we get to Acts chapter 1, verse 6, I don't jump around too much, but in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, the disciples spent 40 days with Jesus. The first question they ask him before he ascends is, when will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, often we think of that as a selfish thing. It wasn't. It was actually a positive thing. Because Peter and, and the 12, well, 11 at the time, let's say, yeah. said 12, they wanted the gospel to go out. They did. So they ask, when will you restore the kingdom? Because when the kingdom is restored to Israel, what does that mean for the rest of the world? Salvation. They didn't think, oh, just for us and not for them. They said, we know we need to go out. We want to reach these people. But for us to reach them, what must happen here first? Revival. So that, that's what the question they're asking. So they actually had a desire to reach, but they knew the process. And I'll, and I'll share some more thoughts on that. So Gentiles were always to be saved, and that was clear in the Old Testament. And it's important when we get to the church. But the way that the Gentiles would be saved would be through Israel's rise to prominence. How do I know that we read the passages every Christmas? Zechariah and Simeon says exactly that. Blessing to Israel, like to the Gentiles. Through Israel's rise, through Israel's position of prominence, through the authority that God gives them, through them becoming priests in the kingdom, they would then reach out to the world. And that you will find in Zechariah. The whole Zechariah is come to Jerusalem. That's where God is. The nation of Israel is the light to bring all of these nations together to worship at the feet of the Messiah. That's the picture. It's always been the picture. We sing these songs out of place. Yeah. Because we always sing about nations coming and the nations will worship. Where? Where is this happening? Where are the nations worshiping at the feet? What feet? Where? It's only because we've got churches now, but the concept is not just nations standing together and praying where they are. The concept in Zechariah is coming to Zion. 
to worship. And it actually says in the book of Zechariah, if they don't keep the feast, it won't rain in their country. That's what it says. So that was the picture in the Old Testament. That's not a mystery. A mystery is not the Gentiles to be saved. The mystery that we are, or the fact that we are saved is not a mystery. The Old Testament said that we would be reached as Gentiles. But the question is, were the Gentiles reached through Israel stepping into a position of prominence? No. The Gentiles were saved because Israel fell. That they didn't see. And the disciples were so worried about that, they remained in Jerusalem for 15 to 20 years after the ascension. Because it was tough for them to take that reality. And the final nail in the coffin of Israel was when the temple was burned down and Jerusalem was burned to the ground in 70 AD. That was the final part of the judgment. So what is the New Testament? What does it show us? It shows us that the world was reached through Israel's fall. The Old Testament tells us the world will be reached through Israel's rise to prominence. That wasn't fulfilled. It will be fulfilled in the future. That's why the tribulation is important. But now God is so gracious that despite Israel's fall, he's like, don't worry. I don't need you. I can still reach the world. Let me show you my glory. It's going to go far beyond this little nation. Mm. And that's the beautiful nature of God. He's like, the same with the church. He doesn't need us. Always have these people thinking, oh, not for you. If it's not for Kenneth. No one's going to be reached. What? Kenneth is dispensable. Someone else will come. He doesn't need us. And if you want to read more about that, you can read Romans 1, 2, and 3, 9, 10, 11. That speaks of this whole picture. So when we think of the mystery, when we think of something that wasn't revealed in the Old Testament, what was revealed was always going to be this light to the Gentiles. That's what the prophets spoke of. And everyone thinks, oh, that's fulfilled. It's not fulfilled. And the reason why it's not fulfilled in its fullness is because Israel is in the position of being a pariah for God. Israel must reach her position or its position of preeminence, as Exodus 19 verse 6 says, a nation of priests. They have to, for the kingdom to be in its fullness. We're not there. Something different has happened. Now we can look at Romans 16. So with that in mind as an introduction, let's look at the text. Because let's look at Romans 16. Now, think of that when you read this text, instead of just reading the text as people do and just, okay, let's move on. Think of what I just shared with you. And of course, in the in, in part two, three, and four, it will be explained. We're going to build on all of these things. So Romans 16 again. So let's look at verse 25. So yeah, it says here, now to him was able to establish. It's a very important word. What are you established in? What truth? People say, well, just generally truth, really. So do I use the truth of the Old Testament yes. to dictate how I function within the church? Do I use don't bury your father, mm. leave your mother? I've come to bring a sword and I will separate families. Don't take another coat. So I'm sort of, unfortunately, all of us here sin because we've got two coats. <laughs> You've got some money in your purse, don't you? So unfortunately, it's gone because Jesus said, don't do it. Don't even take a stop for your journey. Go to people's houses and look with them. They must look after you. What is the truth that we are established in? Because Paul says, now to him who is able to establish you according to what gospel? <laughs> It says my. Now, people could say it's a ge generic term, but the strange thing is that it's used three separate times. My gospel, my gospel, my gospel. By Paul. By Paul. Yeah. So the key is he's saying that you must be established in something, in the truth of the church, which is the key to understanding the Old and the New Testament. 
And why is this the key? Because if I take a New Testament mindset of what I think the church is and apply it within the Old Testament, it's a dangerous place. Why? I'll share one thought with you. I've said this before. To be part of Israel in the Old Testament, you weren't automatically saved, were you? You had Jews who were circumcised on the eighth day. They were as corrupt as the day is long. They didn't even know Jehovah at all. They were just circumcised because that's what happens. When you're an eight-day-old baby and they're circumcised, you don't have much of a choice, do you? So there were people in Israel that weren't saved. There were, there were many who were, but many who weren't. Not all Israel's Israel, but they were part of Israel. So when God speaks to Israel as a collective, he's not just talking to the saved. He's talking to the whole nation. But to be part of that is not about faith. To be part of Israel was based on circumcision and your lineage of being a Jew. But that was still a collective. But then you look at the New Testament to be part of the church. You cannot be part of the church unless you have been converted. You are not part of the church because you're born in a church. You're not part of a church because your parents are Christians. You're part of the church because you have personally confessed the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. So to talk about the church as a collective is different from talking about Israel because Israel was a physical entity. The church is a spiritual entity. Mm -hmm. But yet it's still spoken of as a unit, as a collective. So when it says here to establish you according to the truth, what is the truth? Understanding the makeup of what the church is. Because I hear so many Bible teachers speak of the church as if it's Israel. And get confused with what those principles are that govern them as a society. Come back to the law, 600 laws. Those laws were all there to govern a physical nation. And therefore, it's important to understand the truth of the New Testament, of what the church is. And the book of Ephesians is key to that because it's the, the doctrine of the church. We'll deal with that in the next few sessions. On this. And then also, let's look at my gospel. Let's look at Romans 2, verse 16. When Paul uses this. Now, again, what's important is eat the orange and spit out the pip. Some people will say, well, he's just using it like that, and I'm sort of straining at a gnat. It's fine. But I'm just highlighting this for you to think about. You either take it or you don't take it. I really have. It's fine. But I just find it very interesting how he uses this. So he says here, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. And then he uses it here in Romans 6 and 25. He also uses it in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. So if you turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Is it there? I'm sorry, I think it's the wrong verse. Okay. 2 Timothy. Thank you, Heather. What can I do with that? I can't survive. There we go. There we go. Thank you. 2 Timothy, sorry, 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. And he says, my gospel. So it can be the fact that he's just preaching this in a generic way. But why I'm saying it's important is this. The question I leave with you. Mm. Sorry. The question I leave with you is, what is the final revelation in the Bible? Because the book of Revelation does not actually say anything new. If you read the book of Daniel, you'll read the book of Revelation. It's the same thing. The final revelation that completes the word of God is actually what was given to Paul to write. How many books of the New Testament does Paul write? 13. If you look at Colossians 1, we're going to share that in the, in the next few sessions. It says that, it, that God has given this revelation to Paul to complete the word of God. Because whatever we need to know about the fullness of Christ and what he's come to do, you will not find in the Gospels. You will find it in the Pauline Epistles. Sorry, um, can I? Yes. What, what first was that there? You said that Paul was given the revelation, the final revelation. It's Colossians chapter 1, from 24 to 27. Okay. What? 1, 24 to 27. Yeah, 24 to 27. It says there that, he's, that God has given him this revelation to complete or fulfill the word of God. Okay, so what's what's important? What's important is the fact that you look at the book of Romans. The book of Romans unpacks the cross. Nowhere else is the cross unpacked. If you read the Gospels, it doesn't unpack the cross. It, it shares principles, hundred percent, but the 
depth of the cross is revealed to us throughout the, the epistles. And that's what Paul came to do, to be someone that gives us exposition on what's happened. As Jesus gave exposition on the Old Testament, it's beautiful when he reads the Isaiah scroll. He reads the Isaiah scroll, reads the first part, closes it up and says, today this is fulfilled, but there's still another part that is fulfilled in the future. Jesus Christ gave exposition. Paul does the same as Peter does. So the New Testament writers gives exposition on what happened. And that's why it is very important. So Paul calls it my gospel, as I said. It could be a throwaway statement, but I think it's very significant what was given to him because of the amount of books he wrote. So Peter was the head of the 12, and he wrote two epistles. The head of the 12. Paul the Apostle, Johnny come lately, wasn't even there when Jesus walked the face of the earth, writes 13. It's significant. Very significant. All right, let's move on. So in, in Romans 16, yeah. We that, that's, that's, that's part three. <laughs> no, 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 but, but it's good. We, we, no, we're gonna go, no, we're gonna go for it. It's clear there when you read it, 100 percent So um so if you look at let's go back to Romans 16. So again, you can reserve judgment until we finish with a series, and I think then we can look at some questions. So let's let's look at Romans 16, uh, 20, 25 again. So now to him who's able to establish you, that's important, according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to what? So the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to what? Mystery. Yeah. So, so what is he preaching in accordance with? Now, of course, the gospel that Paul preached was built on the foundation of Jesus Christ and built on the foundation of the Old Testament. That's not uh, debatable. It is the foundation. The question I'm asking is not the foundation of it. The question I'm asking is the edifice. What's he building with? With what material is he building with? Is he taking Old Testament material and building upon this? No, he's building with revelation material. Here's the foundation. Right? We all know the foundation. How do I know this? Read 1 Corinthians 3. I've laid the foundation. But we build upon this foundation. So Paul is building this edifice, which is called the teachings of the church. And he says here that I'm preaching Jesus Christ according to the revelation, the mystery, which is kept secret. So if, it, if it's according to the prophets in its fullness of teaching, why does it say kept secret? Doesn't make sense. Why does he call it a secret? It wasn't revealed. Logical. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't revealed. No, it's not, it's not understanding that, Heather, because the, the word there is wisterion, which is something that you can't see. It's something that has to be unveiled. It's very similar to the word apocalypsis, which is revelation. To, to see something behind a veil, it's where Keith's picture is perfect. It's something that's behind a veil. It's always been there. But only when you draw the curtain, you actually see what it, what, what it is. So Paul is saying, again, I'm driving this home, that he's preaching Jesus Christ in accordance, not with the law and the prophets, because the law and the prophets spoke when the world began. Jesus actually says, that's quite interesting, that you know what the prophets said since the world began, because all those were prophets. But this is not prophetic in the sense of Old Testament prophecy. It's in accordance to the revelation, the mystery, that was kept secret. So turn with me to Acts chapter 321. Okay, Acts 321. Yeah, on Romans 16, verse 26. Um, so I'm a little confused. And it says, um, I get the verse 25, I get that fully. Uh, but now made manifest, and by the prophetic scriptures mm -hmm. made known to all nations. So but isn't that um, wait a minute? What is one of the what are one of the gifts? In the book of First Corinthians 12, which one of the gifts? Oh, prophecy. So, so, so he's oh, yes. Oh. New Testament prophets, not Old Testament. Right, got you. Ah, oh, got you. Okay. Yeah. New Testament prophets, because Paul was writing scripture. That's what a prophet was. A prophet spoke for God. What is the New Testament writers on our prophets? So writing the, the writing of the scriptures. Yeah. So now it's been revealed. Why? In the writing of the scriptures. Now, 
Paul writes, but Peter affirms what Paul is saying. How do I know? Because in Peter it says, the things that Paul says are sometimes difficult to be understood, that people wrestle with. But now we know this because it's been revealed to us to write about. Yeah. If you read Peter's epistles, they echo much of what Paul says because the Holy Spirit is revealing this truth now. And how do I know that? Because when Peter goes to Cornelius' house, he didn't think of these things and God reveals to him. Read Acts chapter 15 with the council in Jerusalem. Now I know a truth. Also says that in the book of Acts. Now I know that God is not a respect of persons. Now it was being progressively revealed throughout the New Testament. So it's not spoken in Zechariah, not spoken in Isaiah. It's the New Testament prophets. And it's in Acts chapter 3, verse 21. Hmm? No, it's the Bible. Because when Paul is writing this, Heather, nothing's been written. It's only the Old Testament. No, so only the Old Testament was written. So what are they busy writing now? What is, what is, what is Paul busy speaking now and writing? The New Testament. That's the prophet. Yeah, and he's a prophet. Because a prophet is just a mouthpiece for God. So the Holy Spirit reveals what needs to be spoken and needs to be written to him. And he now unfolds this. So he went with is always the word of God. Word of God. Is, so he's just saying it's been revealed to us now. It wasn't revealed previously. Now it's been revealed in the prophetic scriptures that we are writing. Because you think, as soon as we hear prophets, Heather, you're thinking. Yeah, no, but it's all. Because it wasn't just him. Because he wrote, Peter wrote, John wrote, Jude wrote. All the New Testament guys are writing this, these scriptures that are prophetic. And that's why as well, the, the, these how about church talk about prophecy? It's like, yeah, it's no. not, prophecy it's is just not speaking God's word. That's what yeah. it is. So let's look at Acts chapter. Yeah. In my mind, it feels that Paul's the most persecuted in apostleship. I just wonder if that's because he is reaching the church as the others are reaching the Who persecuted him? Jews. And Gentiles. You won't find Paul being or Peter being as persecuted by the Gentiles. Yeah. He's normally dealing with whom? Peter's normally persecuted by Jews because that's where he's focusing his ministry. But Paul is persecuted because he's preaching the Jews hated and the Gentiles hated. Because the Jews hated because of grace, the Gentiles hated because it calls them to turn away from paganism. And that's why it's so interesting in the book of Acts where they, had to, where they burned the books and they so. Everyone hated him because that's what the gospel does. That's a good point. So it really, really is. He is, yeah, the one that took it on the chin. But, but again, ultimately, I believe once, because Paul said, Paul often speaks about the fact that he didn't confer, he didn't speak to other people. He only went and spoke to Peter. So before he went on to his missionary journeys, he didn't, he was sort of like, Lord, I received this, but I need to confirm this with Peter. Why? Because you can't have Peter and Paul at loggerheads. It's not conducive for the church. So Paul goes and speaks to Peter. Peter confirms what you're saying. And how did he confirm it? Not because of anything other but Cornelius. If it wasn't for Cornelius, Peter would have gone, who are you? Yeah. But because of Cornelius, as soon as Paul came, okay, I'm with you. God is showing me as well. Boom. Right. Whole change in the picture. New motivation. New going forward. Because unless, <laughs> then if you read Acts chapter 11, after Peter spoke to Cornelius, the other disciples said to him, you were wrong. It says that they're in the scriptures. It says they contested with him for speaking to a Gentile. Because they didn't understand that the picture now is we're going out despite these guys not being interested. We're moving beyond them. And that's what Paul came to do. And that's why everyone hated him. Because he really shook the, shook the, the bag. Mm. And the cage. No, no, please, please, please. They would have 100%. So, and would they have known that Jesus would be the seed of the woman? That they wouldn't have known. Because nowhere does it say Jesus. Nowhere does it say uh, Joshua is coming. They don't know that. Only when Jesus Christ was announced, they said, You will call him 
Jesus. You will call him Yeshua. Jehovah saves. So that's that's the key point. Messiah. Yeah, the Messiah was coming. But when they, as soon as they said Jehovah saves, they knew this is the Messiah. This is the one. And then they are, okay. That's why Peter was, I mean, it's great with Peter. Peter's great. Jesus just calls him. Peter's like, okay, it's you. Because <laughs> he knew. Once he saw, what did Simeon say? My, my eyes have seen salvation. Okay, really good. Mm -hmm. So let's look at Acts chapter 3, verse 21. In comparison now to Acts or to, to Romans 16, listen to the terminology. Whom heaven must receive, that's Jesus Christ, of course, until the times of rest, restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his prophets since the world began. So in Romans 16, it's a mystery kept secret since the world began. But the restoration, there's the kingdom promise. That's what it is. The kingdom promise of, of Israel being restored. And the world being blessed wasn't a mystery. Do you see that? Because it was spoken by the mouth of the prophets. You with me? So yeah, let's look at it again. So Peter says, heaven must receive Jesus Christ until the time of restoration, which is the kingdom of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his prophets since the world began. Do you see the dichotomy between the prophets spoke this, but the mystery was kept secret and not revealed. So Acts chapter 3, verse 21. The kingdom. So from the beginning. Spot on. So when we look at the Proto-Evangelion, which is Genesis 3, the seed of the woman, that promise is of salvation, yes, but salvation with the fact that the seed will come and crush the head of the serpent, which is the kingdom. The promise from Adam and Eve was the restoration. It Basically went wrong at a, at a tree and it ends up with a tree. But so, it was at that time, no, but it was still a prophetic utterance. But the prophetic utterance is not Jesus Christ comes and brings salvation, you have the church. The prophetic utterance was Jesus Christ will come and restore all things back to what it was. That's the that's the promise always what Israel had was the restoration. That was the, the picture. That's what the Proto-Evangelion is. We now know what that means in hindsight. But at the time, the only thing they looked forward to was the restoration. So that's why in, in, in Romans 16, yeah, the revelation of the mystery kept secret. In contrast to the prophet, prophets who spoke since the world began. But let's look at what it says when it says now manifested. Ephesians 3. This is also a passage. So, Jim, you went wrong in, in preempting. We're going to preempt quite a few things because we need to go through this again. So, if you look at Ephesians 3, 1 to 6. So, Ephesians 3, 1 to 6. So I'm going to preempt one of the, the sessions. We're going to deal with it in more detail. But I just need you to, to see this. Because he says it's now manifested. Something has been manifested now. It was kept secret, but now it's been revealed. What has been revealed? Let's look at it from verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. I mean, you'd never hear that in the Old Testament. <laughs> if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you. Do you see the me again there? I just highlight that with my gospel. And here's me again. Such an egotistical guy, this Paul. <laughs> How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already. Where has he written already? We've just read what he's written already, which is Romans. By which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. See the Roman 16 connection. Now, and what is this mystery? Verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. You say Gentiles fellow heirs to a Jew, they will lose their Mind. There's only one son of the covenant. There's only one chosen of God, and that's the covenant people, Israel. You don't go to Jews saying that you are also chosen. Pork eaters are not chosen. <laughs> that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, sons. So they'd be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Goodness me, that is huge. And that's what's now been manifested. That's what he's saying. And that's unveiling the mystery. What is that mystery? That Jew and Gentile now on equal footing, as they weren't before, but now they are. That you and I can say with absolute confidence, 
that there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, that we are standing before, that we can stand before Christ on equal footing than a, than a Jew, because a Jew must come through Christ. There is no preference. There's no position because you have Jewish lineage. It means absolutely nothing. Because Gentiles are fellow heirs. And so you couldn't say that two and a bit thousand years ago. You lose their minds. And then let's look at verse 26. And it says, but now it's been made manifest by the prophetic scriptures. So some translations say scriptures of the prophets. But it should read in the Greek prophetic scriptures. Prophetic, I think the authorized version says scriptures of the prophets. I think the, the King James says scripture of the prophets. But the, the, it should be prophetic scriptures in the Greek. You can change this because it's it's it will bring in the the, the, the text as well. Yes. What yes. first is that? What first is that? It's um Romans six uh, sixteen twenty six now. So okay. now it's been made manifest by the prophetic scriptures and has been made known to all nations. So let's look at the all nations very quickly. I want you to turn with me to Matthew fifteen twenty one to twenty eight. So Matthew fifteen. 21 to 28, when you look at all nations. It's a well-known dynamic, but it says now something has been revealed. What is that? What has been now revealed is that every nation are fellow heirs if they are in Christ. But let's look at what happened in the Gospels in Matthew 15, 21 to 28. Let's look at what happens in the Gospels. And Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And the disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Now, you just read that at the time. Uh -huh. Read that now in light of Ephesians 3, 6. Do you see the difference? Mm -hmm. But what did this woman know? This Seraphonician woman is very interesting. Tyre and Sidon is very interesting. So Tyre was sort of near, near Israel. But what was interesting was that there was a group of people that were Syrophoenicians. So they were actually more Assyrians. That's what Phoenicia is. And it's amazing because they were Gentiles that lived in that area, that little community of Syrophoenician people, which is very interesting. That's where she came from. But she knew the scriptures, this woman. Because let's look at Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23. We're going to come into land. We're coming into land. We're just, we're just over sort of Beaconsfield, and we're on our way in. So Zechariah 8, 23. So Zechariah 8, 23. Well-known verse as well. It says, thus says the Lord of hosts. In those days, ten men from every language of the nation shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So you have ten from every language of nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you. We have heard that God is with you. What did this woman do? She came. Speak to Jesus, and Jesus said, no, the children must eat first, and then the dogs. It's not a bad term. It's, it's a puppy. It's, it's an endearing term. It's not a negative term. Then you will you get your food. And she understood. She said, yes, we want to eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. So she acknowledged the children must eat first. She didn't say no. She didn't have an attitude. She acknowledged, I know. And then we will receive the crumbs that comes from the master's table. Trust me, the crumbs from the master's table is far better than anything else. And she understood. But now it has changed. So, again, yeah, so Jesus changed his tune the way to this woman because she demonstrated her faith in him yes. as yes. the Messiah. 100%. That's right. 100%. And she was searching. She was saying, yes, I, she acknowledged the process. 
So when you acknowledge the process, it shows you on. Yeah, See, yeah. rebellion is a dangerous thing, Kenny. That's the well. rebellion. Yeah. See, that's the issue. Yeah. The true faith. So if we were living in the Old Testament, yeah, yeah. we would subscribe to everything. Makes sense. We would yeah, do. Yeah, we would yeah. follow the law. Why? Because we trust the Lord Jesus Christ now. So in, yeah. if you were living there, you would follow the process. You won't be perfect, but you'd follow the process. This woman knew the process yeah. and was willing to follow the process. Yeah, yeah. And that showed her great yeah, faith. Like, take, take, you know, it's not me. Oh, that's it. Oh, exactly. So she would, if you had a rebellious attitude, it shows she didn't understand. Yeah, yeah. So if you truly had faith as a Gentile, Even as a Gentile. you would yeah. understand this is my process. Yeah. And she understood that. She acknowledged that. Yes. And the nations will have to come through Israel. Through Israel. When Israel, when Israel is in that position of authority, yeah. nations will then say, yeah. we need to go with yeah. you. Because so that's the picture. That, that was the expectation the gospels that Jesus Christ was setting. We are moving toward that. But what do they say? No, no, we'd rather want Barabbas. Uh, and then she understood that because that was the Old Testament. Exactly. The same as, uh, read the woman at the well. The woman at the well knew the scriptures. We know the Messiah is coming. and When he comes, he will do all these things. She knew the scriptures. Samaritan and Samaritans knew the scriptures. So that's the thing. The scriptures are key. And then finally, in, in Romans 16... It wasn't, it wasn't totally outside. It was more towards the... No, it wasn't totally outside, but it was a certain portion within it that was Gentile. It's the same as the Gadarenes. Remember when, when Jesus uh, sends the demons to the pigs? There were portions, and she had come from a little community <laughs> of Gentiles. So he would be walking around. I mean, he went through Samaria. He went through those places, but there were portions where he would skip. It's not your time yet. If you want to hear, then you're going to have to hear through a Jewish person. But the Messiah came to confirm the promises first. Every time he speks to a Gentile, it's exceptional. It's not normative at all. Okay, so it was sort of in the north. Okay, let's look at the Gospel of the Jews first, and Jesus endorses that by the interaction he has with both of those ladies. It's not that he changes his mind and goes, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, now that I see you, right? He would have healed, right? Before. Yes. The she had. And she would always be saved, like the centurion. There would always be salvation. But the Messiah's purpose is primarily not to go out and preach the gospel to Gentiles. That was in his primary purpose. His primary purpose was to gather people from within the nation to then go out. That was his primary purpose of his three year ministry. Yeah. But then they, rejected they did. Yeah. And what's so beautiful is even though they rejected him, he had enough of a little flock with him, and they became the foundation of the church going forward. Because that's how God works. Because the whole point was the scriptures must be fulfilled, and the scriptures said they will reject him. But he showed them everything that they needed so that they were without excuse. And that is why the judgment was so harsh, because they were without excuse. And, and even these passages, the centurion mentioned of this woman, it's really, it's speaking, he's speaking really to the Jews, isn't he? Look. Yeah, he is. 100%. These people, if you get it, and it's like, but you don't. they're not even the chosen ones. You should be. Exactly. Because faith, this is the key thing. Can you, again, this is yeah. a big one for me. I just want to leave with you. People were being saved outside of Israel for thousands of years. Don't just think that the only way that people were saved was through Israel. If you met Israel, that was your process. But if you were somewhere on an island and you never met a Jew in your life, God would still work. People were never lost. God will always make a plan. That's what Romans 1 says, yeah. creation in your conscience. But when you met Israel, which happened often, why? Because Israel impacted all the great empires yeah. of history. You had a response to say, these are the covenant people. I must respect the process. But if you never met a Jew, God would work with you. So don't think that Gentiles weren't being saved. They were still being saved. But the Old Testament tells us what the conduit is. And when you are in contact with the conduit, there must be a certain response to the conduit. Don't reject the conduit. Because if you reject the conduit, it shows you don't care about what God has said. And that's dangerous. The final thing we say is, in conclusion, the final thing we want to say is, the final part in Romans 16, 26 speaks there about the obedience to the faith. It doesn't say obedience or faith. It says obedience to the faith. And that's the question I leave with you. What is this faith that we must know? Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
100%. But faith in what work? Because the centurion that Kenny mentioned, you have the Seraphonesian one. Was her faith in the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? No, her faith was just in the Messiah. Yeah. So, of course, while the only faith you have is what is being given, and that's the Messiah, that's great. It's 100% effective, 100%. But now that we have more revealed to us, what is our responsibility to what has been revealed? And that is to accept the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ as the foundation of the gospel. And yet, let's go to 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6, as we conclude. And Paul writes here and says, But we command you, strong words, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, not according to the traditions which he received from us. And this is the challenge that I leave with us as we speak about this. Is that we have many, many people who are sincere, but they are not teaching the truth. And it makes it very awkward and difficult for us. I'm not saying that we must just cut people off. Or not. I'm just saying that the gravity of this. So you either agree with me, it's fine. If you disagree with me, it's fine. But you must take responsibility for why you disagree. Because all of us are accountable. I'm very happy to stand here accountable for what I teach. But all of us have to take accountability. As, as many of you are in our church, you can't trust me and say, well, I'm going to do what Kenneth says because that must be right. You have to be accountable. But I, I urge you to think through this. What you define as what the revelation of the mystery is here. If you don't agree with what I shared today, it's fine. But you must have a view on what this is. Because by this and by your very faith in what you believe, you are accountable to God. It's not just a case of, well, I just, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. It matters. Because Paul is saying very clearly within the, to the church in the Thessalonians, in the fellowship at that time, it's very different. It was a house church. It was a bit different, but it's another conversation. But if there's someone that is disorderly and against what is being taught, you must disassociate with them. Because it's a, it, it is dangerous to the faith and the walk of other believers. And that's why we have to be accountable. And that's why I leave this with you to think through. So when you read Romans 16 again, as we go through this series, I trust that there will be some more thoughts and that you will be led to the scriptures to see if what is being said is so, as the Bereans were. So what was the question The question I'm leaving you with is you must know what this is. You must, you must have an idea of what the mystery is. If you, if, you don't, if you don't agree with me, it's fine, but you must be able to tell me what this text is in your own mind then. What is the secret that has been hidden? It's now being revealed. What is that secret? What is it? And if, if you're saying to me it's not what you said, again, it's fine, but you must have an idea what it is because it's serious. Because Paul makes sure that he lets us know it's serious. So unfortunately, now that you know, you can't say, well, it doesn't matter. It matters because if Paul is saying that you must disassociate with anyone that doesn't teach the teachings I have taught, I'm not saying we must do it, I'm just showing the gravity of it. Yeah. We can't have a blase attitude to say, well, it doesn't really matter. It mattered to Paul, and it mattered to what he taught the Thessalonians. Therefore, it must matter to us. And, and is that secret over and above, for example, what he said to the Thessalonians? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, again, it's, you're dealing with two things. You're dealing with the foundation of the gospel, and then you're dealing with the edifice of the gospel, yeah. which is filling up all the other areas, okay. which you build your house upon, and, be, and take heed how you build. Wood, hay, or stubble, or gold, silver, or precious stones. Good. Any, any, any questions as we conclude? Just to clarify, mm, sure, sure. The, the, the mystery that uh, Jew and Gentiles co coerced. Co for what was hidden was they thought the nation of Israel um, has to rise to face the enemies in order for the gods to say that would happen during Jacob's trial. That was really spot on. Uh, spot on. Oh, I get it. And that's why, and this is why the rapture is important, because yeah. what happens is we have people running around talking about end times, and they think they, they just because it's nice for them. No, the rapture must take place to usher in the time of Jacob's trouble, yeah. to bring Israel to repentance, to bring the kingdom to reach the world. But the rapture makes no sense if the mystery is not true. That's what I'm trying to say. What's the use of a rapture if it's not a mystery? The whole point is prophetically the mystery then 
is fulfilled and therefore you start ushering in the prophetic plan again because christianity doesn't fit into the old testament's prophetic plan it makes no sense but it makes sense if it's a mystery and it makes sense that if the rapture and when the rapture takes place it starts ushering in the plans and purposes to bring israel to a position of promise and prominence and that's why it's called not the tribulation it's called the time of jacob's trouble is actually its title because that's what it is it's bringing jacob to salvation good right so, any questions uh, from the yeah. book? the um the revelation so the mystery that's now being revealed is the jew and gentile together as the body of christ is it yeah the church yes that's what it is okay good right yeah um with uh, i don't know this is a difficult but it's a bit of a controversial passage but um mark 16 um the uh, jesus says to them he appears to the 11 and he said to them go into all the world and preach the gospel to every preacher he who believes and is baptized will be saved but he who does not believe will be condemned and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will burn them. Hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. <laughs> now, obviously, that this is not something for us. This is this is after Jesus. Yes, and it was fulfilled, Kenny. So the, the question that passage, as we know, it's a disputed passage. Yeah. You said, but if you look, even if it. Even, in, yeah, exactly. The issue is all those things are fulfilled in the book of Acts. Mm, Paul's bitten yeah. by a snake. The healings are taking place. So, yeah. so uh, to me, it doesn't matter if it's disputed or not. The issue is that all those things that you've spoken of was fulfilled. So mm. as, this, as, as this message was building momentum to ultimately get to what we have today, you need signs and wonders to confirm certain things. So part of the early part of Acts was signs yeah. and wonders was Just part so of the yeah, process yeah, to get the yeah, momentum. Yeah, it's, 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 100 it's the book of acts yeah and then once it's been established it's finished right but bless you uh one last thing one uh sorry the so jews jews really are and jews once they trust in christ they're now christian yes they are so they can't really your christianity is the preeminent part of you not the judaism mm -hmm. okay so the judaism is secondary to your uh, christianity okay. okay but let's pray let's thank the lord for this time Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you have shared with us today. And we trust that we'll be greatly encouraged. So we know that there are many things that we still need to grow in and we just go and read and we don't know everything, but it's part of us just really looking at the church and where we fit in and what you've called us to do, which is very important. If we know the sound that the, the trumpet makes or the instrument makes, we know how to respond. But unfortunately, it just seems that there are many different voices and noises and people don't know what to do. So we pray that we'll have clarity on what you've called us to do so we can live for your honor and glory. We just thank you for this day and commit ourselves to you. In your wonderful name we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Amen. Have a wonderful day. God bless. Amen. Thank you. God bless. Bye-bye.